Okay, today's date is March 20th, 2018. My name is Tracy Grimm uh, at Purdue University Libraries, and today I am picking up with part two of oral history interview with Mr. Robert F. Wells. Mr. Wells, thank you again for taking another bunch of time to talk with me on the phone and to pick up with where we left off on our last interview. You're welcome, Tracy. Thank you. So I think we left off with, um, we concluded with your work on the lunar landing, lunar lander's uh, descent engine, and you had mentioned you we would, could pick up with your career as you moved to the shuttle program. All right. Well, when I finished uh, with the limb engine project, that time I was in the, what we call the power systems division. Our company was organized in several divisions. And I previously I had worked in the space and defense division. So I went back to that division and uh, <clears throat> not really knowing what I was going to be doing, but when I talked to my old boss, uh, he had a job waiting for me to uh, take over. Uh, it was a pretty important job on a major project where I'd be responsible for all ground support equipment design and construction and all mechanical testing. Now, this project, it was not a shuttle project. It was earlier than that. Uh, it was also a highly classified project, so I will be saying nothing about the payload itself. That, that information is still classified today. But I can talk a little bit about what I did. Uh, there was quite a large amount of uh, handling equipment needed for transporting and moving the payload. And I was responsible for all of that, plus all mechanical testing, and there was, there was a large amount of testing done. A friend of mine had been in charge of it prior to that, but he had gone on to another assignment, so they wanted me to take it over. So I did that. Uh, it was a very enjoyable job. It lasted maybe two or three years, and then I was looking for something to do again, and the company was kind of in a slump. Uh, the Apollo program had ended, and we'd gone through a major layoff, so I was put to work writing proposals for new work, and, and this was a very interesting job because we were dealing with things that hadn't been done yet the very leading edge of technology. Uh, sometimes we weren't even sure how we were going to do it. But these were contracts we wanted to bid on. And it turned out, by chance, uh, the type of writing they wanted it was something I was kind of a natural for. I, the, the proposals were page limited. So you had to jam as much information you could in as little few as words as possible. And they decided I was pretty good at that. So <laughs> I did that for a full two years. <clears throat> was that at, at TRW, Mr. Wells? Yes, this okay. is all at TRW. Okay. Um, one day when I was working in a room almost by myself, uh, these jobs tend to be scattered around in different areas. Sometimes I'd work on two or three simultaneously. There were two other men working in the room who I knew from a previous program. They were working on something entirely different than I was. But they said, 
turned out what it was, and it was another classified program, which I won't be able to say anything about, but in those kind of programs, you need people who can uh, work with both sides, the classified side, and there are a lot of people that don't have clearances that need to support the program, so somebody has to communicate between those two groups, and that, that's what our job was. We had a small group of about a dozen engineers, each of whom was a specialist in some area, and we would gather all the requirements from the classified side and convey it to people that needed to perform who were not cleared. And it also involved a lot of travel because uh, there were various contractors and uh, parts of the government involved. And uh, I was traveling about 100,000 miles a year. Hmm. Wow. Uh, eventually accumulated 1.3 million frequent flyer miles. <laughs> but it was uh, fun and interesting. And it was interesting from the standpoint that uh, all the people that I was coordinating with, telling them what I wanted them to do and when they had to do it, didn't work for me or my company. Hmm. But they knew I had a lot of horsepower behind me, so they did what I told them. <laughs> As an example, uh, we were having a series of spatial meetings that weren't in the original schedule, and a fellow, we were having daily meetings, it was so fast and so important. A fellow from uh, McDonald Douglas was giving me a hard time in every meeting, but I didn't have much trouble telling him he was wrong. One day he didn't show up, and I asked one of my uh, government contacts, uh, what's that guy from MacDeck that's always giving me a hard time? And the response was, don't worry about him, he's been reassigned. <laughs> so that's the kind of situation I was in. If I, if I needed any... Uh, higher level of authority it was available. <laughs> so I did that for, gosh, it was almost 10 years. And that was a shuttle program. So I was working with Space Shuttle all the time. Got to know some of the uh, astronauts. One in particular was Ellison Onizuka. Hmm. 
So tragic. So that was a little emotional. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I worked on that project for nearly 10 years, and that ended up my career. I finally retired at uh, right around 65. And that was my the end of my space career. I did do another job for the Toro Company later, but I don't think that's of much interest in this instance. Now, I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> Neil and I. Neil was, a, I think he was two years behind me in school. He came directly out of high school. So this was 1947, January 47, when I arrived at campus. And that was really the first big influx of former military people. Uh, There's been about a year's delay before they really got themselves organized and went Mm. through the application process. Congress had passed the GI Bill, which made it possible for a lot of these guys to go to college who probably would not have without the GI Bill. Mm-hmm. And, and I was using it also. And that paid for our tuition, which you probably won't believe, but I think it was $150 a semester. <laughs> I don't think I did. Hmm. I will double check. I sent four photos. Okay. Well, Maybe they were too large, but I'll, I'll double check when we'll we... figure that out later. Yep. So, uh, all these men suddenly showed up in the freshman class. Any women in the military, there were a few, but not 
strange to me. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so all of my friends Where, where would you fly? Where would you practice? Well, there were some large open fields around the campus that were either used for uh, intramural athletics or some of them didn't seem to have any use at all, but they were open and mm-hmm. available. In the winter, we did some flying inside the armory building. Oh, yeah. over to Lafayette?
Yeah, the the chocolate shop, Harry's chocolate shop. It's still here. <laughs> it's all there. It's Harry's, huh? Yeah, now it's Harry's. Oh, well, now it's Harry's. I, it, it might have been Harry. I'm not sure what it was called. Well, I, I might be wrong about the name. <laughs> but what I understood was they had passed the law against any alcohol being sold in West Lafayette, but <laughs> he was the only one in town that had a license, and uh, they had a grandfather clause. He was able to keep his license, but they didn't issue any new ones. <laughs> so <laughs> he had a gold mine. Yeah, well, I, I don't think it... I think it probably looks the same as it did when you were here on the inside. <laughs> I was only in there one time, and it was so crowded, <laughs> I didn't stay. Yeah. Well, you'd be surprised. Um, just this past year, they opened a bar inside the Union on evenings, 4 to 9 p.m. and on the weekends. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> strict. Yeah, how were the rules? Was it... Beg pardon? I, I, I just thought of a question. Uh, was it very strict on campus? I mean, and that must have been hard for guys coming back from the military. Well, they had, they had some traditions that we didn't adjust to very well. One was somebody told me uh, all freshmen have to wear a green beanie. Oh, yeah, the beanies. <laughs> there were no green beanies that year. <laughs> they still do that? Uh, no. Well, a co there's a couple of student clubs, history clubs. They they may make them and do it, but not very many people do. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, anyway, well, you know, academically it was always tough. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I had some very difficult classes. One Did of my hardest was that we had a visiting Chinese professor, Dr. Xu Lo. He was about 25 years old and had two PhDs. Oh, my goodness. And uh, it was uh, a course in structural dynamics some complex math involved. Class was maybe 15 people, and it lasted 50 minutes. And he was so well prepared. If you weren't in your seat with your notebook open and ready to start writing, when he walked in the room, you would never catch up. Oh, wow. make a mint if they impose that <laughs> rule now. <laughs> Remember any other any other classes or professors stand out in your mind? Well, there was another one in the Arrow School, uh, Dr. Liston, who taught uh, aircraft engine design and theory. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. 
yes, I've heard people talk about him before. <laughs> yep. And uh, let's see. But the head of the Arab school, his name was Ron or Brian or something like that. He had written a text on yep. the aircraft structures that we used. Yep. Mm-hmm. Where was the wind tunnel? Was that out at the airport, or was that uh, something here on campus? Yes. Uh, it was out at the airport. Right. I'm not sure it was there originally. It might have been on campus, but later it was moved to the airport. Yeah. And it was uh, one that the students had built at some point before I got there. It was a very uh, good thing to have for instruction. Did you, fl oh, I'm these sorry. These two guys also did their master's thesis based on the research they did. I forgot if I asked you last time, did you fly at all when you were here? Out of the airport? Yeah. Or? I did not fly myself. Um, I did take a class in flight test where we actually flew a, uh, an airplane and tested. We had so many pilots in the school, there was no shortage of pilots, and uh, the, the day that I went up to do some tests and collect data, the pilot was uh, a former Navy pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, because of the kind of data we were doing, and we were flying at very low altitude. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Take 
Like riding a bicycle, right? <laughs> yeah. I could probably do it today. Mm -hmm. uh, have we covered everything? I think that was some... Oh, one thing I did want to tell you. After graduation, I did have some contact with Neil occasionally. Um, one of the first things that happened was uh, I was in L.A. working for the Douglas Company. And it, one of the club members was out at Edwards Air Force Base. Doing, he worked for the same... It wasn't Douglas. It was North American I was working for. He was working for the same company on a different program, but he was working at Edwards, and he lived in Palmdale, which is the closest town to Edwards. So he organized a little reunion. Uh, I went out with my wife. Uh, this, his name was Keith Smith. He and his wife lived there. Uh, I think Harold Springer was also there from the club. Neil was there uh, working for NASA and training to fly the X-15, so he, he was invited. I think there was one more, but I can't remember who it was. Anyway, there were about four or five of us got together at Keith's house, had dinner, spent some time together, and Neil was there, of course. Uh, I ran into him again at a, another company I was visiting. He, he happened to be there at the same time, and we bumped into each other. Then uh, when I was working for the Toro company here, and where I live now, there was a big ladies' tournament. It's, it still goes on every February, I think now called the Nabisco Tournament. It's a major professional women's tournament, but they also had a, a pro-am event as part of it, and Neil had been invited to play in that. And uh, I was working at the same location, so I found out what his schedule was and was able to see him and talk to him a little bit. Oh, that's nice. Was that golf, a golf tournament? Yes. Yeah. I, I have a letter that he wrote me after that, if you'd like me to send you a copy. Mm -hmm. Oh, ahead. yeah, Sally just reminded me. When he came back from... Uh, my mind's gone blank. Vietnam. Korea? Korea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was flying off of a carrier doing ground attacks in Korea. And I don't know how many people know this. He, he described it to me himself. He was hit by ground fire, sh shot off part of his wing and an aileron, so the plane was very difficult to control. But he managed to keep it going long enough to get over friendly territory and bailed out. So that was kind of a close call. But but after he got back from Korea, he was flying out of San Diego. The, the Navy, had, I think they didn't know what else to do with him at that time. He was just doing re routine flights between uh, San Diego and L.A. So we were living not far from LAX at that time, and uh, he stopped by to see us. Sally and I had only been married a few years, and she was about to have her first child. Hmm. Or maybe she'd already had it. She says, yes, she did. <laughs> so he stayed with us for a few days. He also sent us a wedding present that I still have. It's a nice insulated ice container we're still using. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so, those are the few times I saw him after graduation. Yeah. He, uh, when the letter he sent me, he said he would, if he got back here, he would look me up, but that never happened. I, I guess he just never got back. He was just a really nice guy. He, fun 
Is there anything else you can think of that we didn't talk about? Hmm. I can't think of anything that's related to Purdue or Neil. But, uh, I think it's your primary interest. And your career, we we kind of we covered a lot I of that. I think we pretty well covered it. What do you mean by that? Beg pardon? What do you mean by that, by one hour? Oh, uh, the schedule that we prepared that everybody had to follow, follow was done on an hourly basis. Oh, wow. That's... 20, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> Once we started, we didn't stop. So yeah. Launch Kirk. And it was a very tight schedule. Wow. That must have been intense.
Well, it certainly sounds like you had quite a fascinating and exciting career. Well, looking back, I think I agree with you. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't change much. Mm. And unfortunately, some of the more interesting stuff I can't tell you about. <laughs> Well, maybe we'll be able to read about it someday when it's maybe unclassified. <laughs> realize some of these things were done 30 years ago and they're still classified. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm still, un I'm still obligated to uh, what's called the Espionage Act. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Wells, I I want to thank you so much for for getting in touch and for taking the couple of hours to talk with us. <laughs>